Hey, Simon, how are you today? I am much better than I've been for the last week. I'll bet. How are you? I'm well, thank you. This is a year that's taught us to appreciate some simple things. Yep. Yep. I turned my water on this morning and I have never been so happy about running water. <laughs> I have three sons in different parts of Texas and um, well, one of them has water. He has to boil it. The other two don't have water. I think they're gonna, at least the one in Richardson should get it tomorrow. So uh, things are coming along. Good. Hey, hey, Roger. Hi, guys. Simon, I, I, I didn't uh, reply to your email. Good grief. What a struggle you've had. Yeah. It's been oh, fun. my God. Um, wow. I'm, I'm thrilled to see you on the meeting. It's uh, I'm amazed you're here. You've been up against it in a way that we didn't we didn't lose power for seven hours on Monday during the day. So we were never in the dark and cold at the same time. And it didn't get that cold in our house. We had sun coming in uh, the apartment. So I don't think we ever got below 60 degrees, that's which nice. is chilly, but it's not it's not cold. Yeah, that's really I was forced, I was, I was forced to read a book in paper. <laughs> read a wow. Book. Oh my oh. gosh, I just what a throwback. So yeah, that's yeah. old old fashioned. I read paper books during the daytime <laughs> when there was sunlight. <laughs> I just signed on to make sure that things were up and running, but I'm I'm gonna close my video and, and be quiet. I, you guys are running things. Terrific. Fantastic. I appreciate it so much. Makes my life a lot easier. Well, Leah, I know Leah and Jeff are in transition today. So she, uh, yeah. she, get, she gave me the nod. At that point, we were unsure what Simon's infrastructure would be. So yeah, I'm, I'm here, yeah. but that's about it. I'm still trying to get ca caught up on emails. Um, oh, I'm God, waiting for it to get warm enough yeah. in my crawl space to, uh, to fix my drain pipe that's leaking, but it's on one, it's only on the kitchen. So I actually got to take a shower, but I'm, I'm here, but not much beyond that. <laughs> okay. No, I understand. Richard, I think you should say something. Uh, I know that, I know that we're, we're sort of participating in this plan of, um, identifying, uh, indigenous peoples uh, who've been displaced from the area. Uh, but I, I also think that at the very beginning, you should, you should make a statement about, about the um, members of the, about concern and, and uh, about, about members of the chapter who have suffered long power outages, who have suffered massive home damage from burst pipes um, who, who may not have, still may not have water. I think there are still areas of DFW that are under uh, boil notices um, mm -hmm. and so on. So let's, let's just, I'm hoping that uh, Maria will do something at the end that, that will be useful in that regard. But I think we ought, to, we ought to start by just acknowledging that we've had some members who've really, like Simon, who've really been through um, some very, very tough times. And um, I think it's worse in some of the other Texas chapters. Um, I know that I know that Houston is unlikely to have most of Houston unlikely to have water before Monday. Um, so they've been if they've had water, they've been boiling it for now two days. Uh, even as their power is coming back on. Austin seems to be in even worse shape. Um, so 
let's just, I would appreciate it if you start with that. Otherwise, I'm going to shut up and get out of the way because I talk too long as it is. Okay, thanks, Roger. I was actually planning to do that anyway. It's, it's even obvious enough for me to realize. Hello, Dr. Casey, how are you? Hi, Maria. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. You're outside? Yes. Yes. I decided after being locked up all week um, that although I'm going to be on my phone or computer that I need, I need some outdoor time. Yeah. Good. Yeah. The sun is wonderful, isn't it? It's marvelous yes um and it'll fit in nicely with the little um visualization i'll offer at the end uh, can you remind me your your name i'm so sorry that i don't know it's richard wayne richard wayne okay lovely i'm writing your name down hey dan hey good morning i'm i thought i was supposed to start the meeting and i realized what time it was oh so good i guess you started it right Yes, I did. I was uh, figured uh, the early bird would get the get the zoom. Okay. Yeah, Lee, I asked me to start it, but I didn't. Uh, I, I'm glad you were here because I just looked at my watch and went, "Oh man, it's late." You're you're good. I just I just came on. Hi, wow, Dr. You both Ka Hi, Dr. Casey. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks, Richard. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. It's good to see you. Thanks. Thanks. It's good to see you can too. I, Thank you guys in? so much for having me on. Uh, I really appreciate it. I wanted to, I wanted to say a, a big welcome to Kara too. Uh, Kara was moderating a session at Dallas Colleges. We were we were invited as a chapter to present, and uh, and and first learned about her work, and have wanted to have her at a meeting ever since then, because I I think so many people in our chapter need to hear about what you're doing here in Dallas with teaching people about regenerative ag. So welcome from me as, as the chair of the chapter. And I think a lot of people are excited about your presentation. Thanks, Roger. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun hearing about uh, the Climate Reality Project um, from you too. So it was the first time I had ever heard of it. So um, that's why we do these events, <laughs> so that we can get to know each other. Yes, good, good positive networking. Hey, Kara. I, I, I'm Dan. I talked to you on the via email Hi, Dan. a time, so good, good to meet you. Thanks. Good to meet you, too. Thanks for coordinating. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Ryan. Hi, Leah. Hi, guys. Yes, I could see some of you waving your hands. I got it. I'll, I'll turn on. <laughs> Wait, so Dr. Casey, I just moved yesterday. Um, so it, it's a mess right now. I'm not gonna turn on my camera, but it's so good to have you here. I think I met you um, in the Sustainable uh, Summit in Roger's session. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, I remember now. It's good to see you virtually again or hear you virtually again. <laughs> So um, I can't imagine what it was like moving uh, during the storm. I'm sorry for the timing on that. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I mean, everything is, the moving part is done. It's just uh, a lot of unpacking. We hired two movers to help. So that, that's, uh, that was really helpful. <laughs> I don't think I can do that myself and my husband, just the two of us. Yep. It's always nice to have more folks around. And it's, uh, it's creating um, more job opportunities for folks too, so. Correct, yep. Hey, 
Hello, Melinda, how are you? Oh, you're mute. My bad. Uh, I'm better. I've been no. gone for a long been gone for a long time, but I'm I'm feeling better finally. Good. We're happy to have you. I'm happy to be back. We still have about four minutes, so we'll we can just chit chat for a while. Looks like uh, Kelly Martin is going rollerblading, although uh, could go ice skating maybe somewhere. Oh, you're muted, Kelly. <laughs> I'm not doing either. Oh. <laughs> Those are my daughters. Ice skating in Rockefeller Plaza sounds like a good thing to be doing. Then you could have come over to White Rock Creek. Yeah. <laughs> it's still frozen over this morning. I mean, it, it froze completely over out from the spillway down. Actually, White Rock Lake had a lot of ice on it too, but the, the creek was frozen completely over and then covered with snow. So I've seen it frozen over a couple of years ago, but never with a couple inches of snow on top of that. Yeah, this, this was the real deal. Yeah, I've lived around here my entire life. I've seen it below zero twice. This is one of the two times. So. I, we got it when we lived in Arvada, Colorado. We were down to 20 below raw temperature. And that was the day I decided to lock my keys in the trunk of my car. So I had to break into my trunk through the back seat. Uh, so that was uh, that was an experience, but that's that's a rarity too there. Uh, the Karens have joined us. Mike Mickey's here. Hello everybody, Lynn. We still have a couple of more minutes, so uh, <clears throat> at least the folks here most likely have power unless um, I know I have a coworker at UT Southwestern. She's been connecting via using her phone as a hotspot. She finally got power yesterday, but her Frontier internet has been down all week and it's still down. So all sorts of infrastructure challenges here in the Texas miracle. Hello, James. Okay, we have one more minute and then we'll get started. Good to see everybody. We weren't sure with the weather and with the infrastructure who would be able to join. It's nice to get some aspect of life back to some semblance of normal. Okay, so it's straight up one o'clock. I will not delay. Welcome everybody. I'm Richard Wayne, I'm uh, one of the events chairs. The first thing I wanna do, hopefully successfully, is share the agenda. Can you all see the agenda? Yeah. Yes. Good. Good. Okay. So just quickly, that's that's our agenda. We're going to do a land acknowledgement. 
indigenous land acknowledgement. Um, Maureen and friend has contributed a creative piece. I'll introduce our speaker, Dr. Casey, who's on the call with us. Um, then Dr. Casey will talk about regenerative agriculture. We'll have a little uh, hello from the faith-based working group, then a bit of a hello from the legislative action working group. Finally, um, Maria will, will uh, help us with some self-care and we will bid adieu. So hopefully we can get done in 90 minutes or less. We're trying to make these meetings shorter. Um, but um, it's, it's been a challenge because uh, there's obviously much, much to say. So let me see if I can stop sharing my screen now. Okay. We'll get all this. I should know this by now. But there we go. I'm not seeing the rest of my Zoom control panel to stop sharing. Let me try this. Meeting control, stop share. Okay, good. Finally got that out of the way. Um, it's good to see everybody once again. We got a, a fair number of people considering the challenges we've had this week. I'm sure that many of you had had challenges. I'm Richard Wayne, the uh, one of the events co-chairs, and uh, we would like to acknowledge first that I know many of the people on this call have had some extreme challenges during this last week with power and water and probably other issues with their infrastructure and home. So I hope you're doing better and I hope the days ahead will uh, bring some relief to you and uh, and many others in Texas who are suffering. Um, having said that, uh, I would like to do the indigenous, indigenous land acknowledgement. Uh, specifically in the DFW area, we are standing and living on the land stolen from the Kickapoo, Wichita, Tawakani, Juminos, and Comanche people who have been harmed yet continue to thrive in the process of colonization and white supremacy. I encourage all of us to go to native-land.ca and educate ourselves on these native communities. Thank you. So with that, let's see if I can once again share my screen. and go to the creative piece. We want to share the computer sound, optimize, and are you all seeing the PowerPoint? Yeah. Somebody, good. Okay, I'll see if we can go through that now. I'm going to start the slideshow. Welcome to the February meeting. Can you hear that okay? The Dallas-Fort Worth Climate Reality Leadership Chapter. I can hear the um, audio, but I'm, I don't see the actual slideshow. This love song is Sonnet 17. Okay, let me try that again. Meeting controls. Yeah, I was just seeing like the thumbnails of the individual slides. Okay. I was hearing and seeing just fine, but it was still just thumbnails, yeah. Let's try it one more time. If a couple of you can stay on audio, we'll try it again. So 
So this is showing the thumbnails. Your yeah, um, when you're sh when you're sharing your screen, instead of selecting the PowerPoint program, okay. go ahead and select the screen itself. Um, this should give you the option to um, share your basically the whole screen. Okay. Sorry, guys. I thought I would be better after zooming for years now, but there's always something. Okay, stop share. And so is that Ryan? Um, before yes. I before I start the PowerPoint. Right. Um, it, you'll have an option to select, you know, several windows, right? Um, and it'll show you the programs that are open. Right. One of the other options, there may, it may be another tab that says screens or something like that. Yeah. There's an option to basically look at, it'll show no matter what program is up, it'll um, show that on the right. screen. I, I, see, I see the screen with the thumbnails, and if I click on that, it'll go to the thumbnails, but not go to the... Um, not go to the... To the actual slideshow. Let me try. So can you see the slideshow now? I mean, the, the thumbnails? I ha it has not resumed um, sharing yet. Okay, we can see that now. See the thumbnails. And you think I should just be able to start the slideshow? Right. Yeah. If you didn't, um, if you, if you're sharing the screen, it should share the whole thing now. And you probably want to be on the very first slide. Welcome to the February meeting of the Dallas Fort nope. Worth okay. Climate Reality. Look at this. Stop share. Welcome to the February meeting of the Dallas-Fort Worth Climate Reality Leadership Chapter. Can you see the... We can see the slide now and um, I can see the meeting controls. Ah, they're, they're, they go away as soon as you, when the, when the mouse... Okay, yeah, the, there's a bit of a pause in this, so hopefully it's working now. Uh, we do not hear the audio. Yeah, she has quite a pause in there, so we'll, oh. give it, we'll give it another few seconds. She spent a lot of time on that, and I think got it as good as she could. We'll give her one more second. I think I'll just... This presentation is brought to you by the Creative Spaces Working Group. It's February, and many of us think of love and Valentine. And so to honor this, we bring you love songs. This love song is Sonnet 17 from Love Songs in the Time of Climate Change by Craig Santos Perez, performed by Russ Messing and Maureen Kellen Taylor. I don't love you as if you were rare earth metals, diamonds, or reserves of crude oil that propagate war. I love you as one loves most vulnerable things, urgently between the habitat and its loss. I love you as the seed that doesn't sprout 
but carries the heritage of our roots secured within a vault. And thanks to your love, the organic taste that ripens from the fruit lives sweetly on my tongue. I love you without knowing how or when the world will end. I love you naturally without pesticides or pills. I love you like this because we won't survive any other way except in this form in which humans and nature are kin. So close that your emissions of carbon are mine. So close that your sea rises with my heat. Okay, I apologize for the requisite technical difficulties and we'll have to practice that a little more, but I think we're past it. And uh, I think we're ready to go on. You could see why I was so insistent on playing that because Maureen and Russ obviously did a wonderful job on that. I hope, you raise your hand if you got to see and hear it. Uh, good, okay, I'm glad. I'm glad it came through finally after my botching it. Um, so I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Kara Casey. And we're very thankful for her joining us. She's the Director of Urban Agriculture and Renewable Resources. She will share her team's experience initiating a successful undergraduate program in urban agriculture at Dallas College. Uh, since joining Dallas College in April 2018, Dr. Casey opened eight new undergraduate university transfer courses in agriculture focused on sustainability, food justice, and increased STEM opportunities for North Texas students. In the fall of 2018, uh, undergraduate enrollment uh, grew from six students to 93. While completing her PhD in plant, insect, and microbial sciences with Dr. Robert Shipp at the University of Missouri, Dr. Casey was supported by a life sciences fellowship. Her dissertation focused on genotype differences of maize nodal root growth in response to mild and severe weather stress how timely. Before joining MU, Dr. Casey studied at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center and completed her BS in agriculture, emphasis in plant health management at the Ohio State University. In 2007, she became the first freshman from the College of Food, Agriculture and Environmental Sciences to win the Denman Undergraduate Research Forum for her research with Dr. Terence Graham on phytothora zoospear chemo attraction to, to soy, soybean roots. I almost got it right. You got it. You got it. So, that was great. Um, let's see. I want to, do you, do you need a, to share your screen, Dr. Casey? Yes, I'll go ahead and do that. Hopefully we can get it to work okay. See? Okay, can you guys see that okay? Yes. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for that kind introduction, Richard. Um, and also, lovely sonnet, that was beautiful. And I really appreciate the way that you opened the meeting too. So thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. 
I uh, wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Dallas College so that you can be aware, but also if it's helpful uh, in the work that you are doing uh, and any of your professional endeavors, um, just let me know how we can be of service and help you uh, in supporting the environment. I normally uh, like <laughs> to co-present with folks, especially from the community, uh, because um, I don't like hearing myself talk for a half hour straight. So <laughs> um, if you have a question, uh, I probably will not see it in the chat, but if you want to take yourself off mute and interrupt uh, at any time, that is very welcome. So just let me know if you have a question or if you want to want me to elaborate on something a little bit further. So let's just dive right in. So I did want to establish I'm coming from an agricultural sciences background. Um, I completed my undergrad at Ohio State, so um, I am a Buckeye. <laughs> I did study abroad at uh, the University of Sao Paulo at their Iselki campus, um, looking at the agricultural and food systems there. Uh, it was very beneficial. And at that time, I had no idea that I was going to move to Texas and see a lot of the crops that I, I saw in Brazil, but did not see in Ohio at the time. <laughs> Um, and then also stayed at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center over in Missouri. And it's a beautiful place uh, to conduct plant science research. For graduate school, I, I uh, worked on my PhD in how corn plants are able to maintain their root growth under severe water stress, so drought stress, um, because of course the roots are really pivotal to accessing all those resources in the soil. And we know from, from the literature that roots are able to continue to grow um, in search of that water resources. Um, and we just need to understand the mechanism of how they're able to maintain that growth under stressful conditions so that ideally we can breed plants um, doesn't need to be through a GMO pathway. Um, you can organically um, breed them, conventionally breed them, uh, but just understanding the physiological mechanisms of how plants are able to overcome great stress so that we can uh, make sure our food system is secure in the future. So moving to Dallas uh, back in 2018, uh, it feels like a lifetime ago now, <laughs> but it was only a few years ago. And I absolutely love Dallas. I uh, accepted a position at El Centro. It is right in the heart of downtown. Uh, and it uh, does not have a bit of soil, <laughs> just very uh, little bit. Uh, so what we do is grow on the roof and in containers there. Uh, I was hired to start an urban ag program at Dallas College, and it's funded off of a U.S. Department of Education HSI STEM training grant. Uh, and we're starting that because it's a brand new STEM field, so science, technology, engineering, math uh, field that students can major in and then um, get a better paying job because it's a science-based field. So they could go into plant science research, animal science, food science, uh, food systems. Uh, because of that science background, it tends to qualify you for higher paying jobs. And then um, finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our goal, uh, which was really through this temporary grant funding, to add value um, and bolster the support in the stakeholder community that's already in Dallas um, and help connect them so that uh, when the grant ends, we have added to the community. So um, first off, <laughs> we had to uh, follow the uh, outcomes for the grant. Uh, which were building some greenhouses so that our students had a place to grow some uh, beautiful plants. So uh, we took advantage of some space on the roof. And this on the upper left, you can see that panel of windows uh, is what we enclosed around and created a greenhouse out of. That set of windows is actually the library 
at El Centro. So if you sit at uh, any of the study desks in the library, you can actually sit there and look in and see all the beautiful plants in the greenhouse. Um, so I just think that's a really neat outreach feature <laughs> of our greenhouse. And then uh, we also built a second small greenhouse uh, in the corner of one of the walkways of the roof uh, so that we can have small groups of students uh, rotating through different stations throughout their labs. And we purchased some equipment uh, to support the students in their horticultural and agricultural studies. So we have a new hydroponic system at El Centro and we also have a rainwater catchment tank. So, and this uh, tank came from Rain Ranchers uh, and I highly recommend them. They're really great people and they're local. Okay, so these are the eight courses that we started offering at Dallas College. Um, they are all part of an Associates of Science degree. They're all elective courses. None of them are absolutely required as a core curriculum course, uh, but they're elective courses that will transfer towards a bachelor's of science uh, degree at a four-year institution. So we don't want our students to stop at two years, uh, although we do want them to graduate with that associates of science degree, we want to, them to go on and complete their bachelor's degree because that um, qualifies them for more jobs out in the field upon graduation. These are our lovely flyers uh, that our lab coordinator, Mariah Brown, made for a few of our courses. And we did a lot of outreach on campus and off campus. Uh, nowadays, if it doesn't exist online, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so we have three social media platforms that we reach out to students on. Um, our handle is agriculture.dc. If you wanna follow us, we'd love to connect with you. Uh, so Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, all three of those. Uh, we can stay in contact. And uh, we work with a lot of student groups on campus. So on the left hand side, we have the Environmental Club at El Centro that's planting uh, one of our little uh, garden planters. Um, and on the top right is the Environmental Club from a previous year planting with us. And we also work with uh, different classes on campus. So even if they're in a um, uh, study skills course. If the teacher invites us in to do a session with the students to teach them about um, the stress re relief that comes with working with green things and gardening and how your cortisol drops after 30 minutes of gardening, um, we are more than happy to do a session like that with them. So we come in, we bring our, our little raised bed on wheels over here um, and uh, give them some transplants to transplant and some seeds and uh, they have a lot of fun with that. These planters, by the way, I also highly recommend. Um, they are plastic, so but they can be reused for multiple growing seasons. Um, what's great about them is that they hold water at the bottom of the, the container. So if you go away, in our instance, in the middle of the summer, uh, containers need to be watered really fairly regularly every day. Um, but uh, of course, we're only there Monday through Friday. So with this reservoir container uh, that holds water at the bottom, we can actually water it on a Friday and then come back Monday and water it and it still be alive. So these have come in really handy for us. If you go away on vacation and know, or go away for the weekend and know you won't be able to reach your plants on your balcony or your patio for whatever reason, um, uh, we've found a lot of success with these guys. Cara? Yes. Are oh, those yeah. easily found if you're going to a garden shop or because of what you just described, they're still kind of new and different? I uh, actually, so great question. They are at Lowe's and Home Depot. I, I haven't seen them at smaller nurseries, maybe just because they take up a lot of space and smaller nurse space is such a high premium at retail. But um, to do to do, you can build your own. Uh, so if you just Google uh, DIY reservoir growing container, you can make your own uh, by a series of five gallon buckets or um, Tupperware large Rubbermaid tubs. So good question. 
Thank you. Yeah, the movement's also good to chase the sun, right? The wheels is nice. Yeah, we actually use the wheels because, um, <laughs> and I have to follow myself with a mop <laughs> too afterwards because there's holes on the sides um, so that the, the tub doesn't flood. Because of course, with the reservoir at the bottom, it doesn't drain freely, but there's holes on the sides so that it won't flood the whole uh, tub. Um, I, I wheel this into elevators because again, um, El Centro builds up, not out. So, so we have to take this in elevators up to classes sometimes because uh, it's a lot easier to bring tubs of plants up uh, eight flights than it is to bring 25 students down to the greenhouse. Uh, so good question. Yes, it's very helpful. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we also do outreach with giving away plants. I highly recommend this. I don't know if you guys are at, um, I, I'm assuming you probably are doing some forms of outreach, maybe at EarthX or giving away free plants in, in different ways. I recommend this. Uh, they're just like really large glorified um, ketchup cups. <laughs> uh, that's what they remind me of at least. Um, but they're paper, uh, so you're not wasting plastic. And uh, we just use mailing labels to print information on, and they stick pretty well to the paper as long as it's not really moist. Uh, but this is, I think, um, turnip greens that were given away on the left-hand side. And on the right, we've got some spider plant pups, which proliferate really quickly <laughs> as, as long as you've got a mature plant. And uh, we make the occasional appearance at the Dallas Farmer's Market to, to give away some live lettuce plants and pumpkin seeds during their pumpkin festival. Uh, we weren't able to make it this year, of course, because of COVID, which was unfortunate, but uh, hopefully we will be there again soon. Okay, so now that we have everything set up, and uh, we're very thankful for that grant funding. It's in place. Now it's time to welcome students into classes. So all of our classes are built with a project-based learning framework. So students are working hands-on. They're doing things in the labs to test things out. A lot of our students learn, and I think this is all of us, learn by doing. So um, if you make a cutting of a plant and it dies, you are not going to fail, but I will ask you, what do you think happened? And then uh, you're giving the opportunity to try that again. Um, the middle question, the middle picture is <laughs> a great illustration of when students get a little zealous in planting. Um, a really great illustration of microgreens on the left hand side. But the ideal planting rate is maybe on the right, you know, maybe not so much in the middle. It's getting there. But uh, this is just one of those trial by error situations where it's really helpful for students to walk into a safe place try things out, try to follow the directions. And if there's a nuance that they don't pick up on, they're not penalized for it. They're given the opportunity to do it again and learn from their mistakes. Um, and that's what learning is all about, experimenting. And then at the end of the class, they are able to take all of their plants home, all their different cuttings and seeds that they've started. So it's a lot of fun. We do have to write our labs to be very flexible right now being uh, based off of um, El Centro without ground to plant into. We're using a lot of containers. Um, if you are working with a school uh, garden at all and you are limited on space, that does not need to stop you. You can grow in five gallon buckets or more decorative containers that are about the size of five gallon buckets. Um, and vegetables will grow just fine. You just need to be able to water them um, so that they don't die over the weekends. Um, but again, if you're watering on a Friday and coming back on a Monday, uh, they'll be just fine. Uh, I highly recommend potato uh, for uh, this time. Actually, this is the perfect time to start potatoes in five gallon buckets or in the ground uh, because they mature in about three months, which is about the length of the semester. So by the time uh, students are graduating that year or moving on to their next uh, grade school year, 
uh, they can dump out that bucket and harvest all those beautiful red potatoes or white potatoes uh, that they've planted. And it's really rewarding. So I highly recommend potatoes. Okay, we also uh, get very creative with small spaces. This is some uh, parsley that's growing here uh, along the rail outside the student center. Helps beautify the campus, but also um, I'm a big fan of the more students see something, the more familiar they become with it, the more they maybe internalize it in their subconscious. And then maybe one day they say, oh, yeah, I can do this. I've seen this done before. Um, so just building that familiarity. Uh, but you can grow a lot in a small container without a raised bed. So we've got some basil, got some squash, and got some tomatoes growing there. We also are blessed to have a live wall on campus. So it's an irrigated system of pots that we are able to clean out and plant. Uh, we found that some dwarf kale varieties grow really well there and also leaf lettuce um, and other herbs like um, basil and oregano and thyme and sage. So um, this again is called the live wall. If you're interested in more details or think it would be a good asset for maybe your company to have on the outside of its wall or at your school, please reach out to me. I'd love to help you um, get the information you need so that you can set one up too. In labs, we do vermicomposting. Uh, so each student, pairs up with another student and they each get their own bucket to take care of. Uh, so there are special worms, red wiggler worms, that break down uh, different food scraps uh, and turn that into really great healthy compost that's full of healthy aerobic microorganisms that's beneficial for the soil. So not only are you cutting down on any greenhouse gas emissions from food waste, um, that would go otherwise into the landfill, but you're also building up the soil. Um, and this is something that you can do at home too. I actually, behind the computer, have our worm bins here so that I can take care of them while we're off campus uh, during the COVID and during um, the snowstorm. They don't smell. I highly recommend it. I was skeptical at first. <laughs> the first time I heard about it. But even students uh, who are really scared of the worms uh, and don't want to touch them, you just give them a set of gloves and then by the end of the class period, they're the ones who are scooping them out of the compost and saving worms <laughs> from uh, going outside in the garden. Uh, we also have separate projects that students can take on and be creative with. So if students want to build their own uh, hydroponic system to have at home or uh, experiment with doing different cuttings, different propagation styles, starting their own uh, seeds and uh, taking care of praying mantises, um, we have those opportunities too. Okay, and uh, we partner with UNT Dallas uh, during this grant. We bring students over to the UNT Dallas campus so that they can uh, meet the other students, talk to them, build some camaraderie, and also get more acquainted with the campus. So the literature shows that if students um, from a community college visit universities before they transfer, they're more likely to have a successful transfer. So um, it, it can just happen sometimes where students are very well intentioned, they want to transfer, but for one reason or another, um, they end up slipping through the cracks. But if they are able to visit that campus before they graduate from us at the community college level, uh, they'll have a higher uh, successful rate of transfer, um, either because of connections or they just feel more familiar with the campus. So uh, here they are planting uh, and installing raised beds uh, at the UNT Dallas campus. And they have a lot of fun. They can be a little goofy sometimes. It's a good bonding experience. It's a lot of fun. We also, during the pandemic, have been working at the Mountain View Campus Garden. Uh, they have a beautiful uh, slow food community garden there. And we are very blessed to be able to grow some vegetables in those raised beds. So we've got some Swiss chard here and we've got some broccoli growing in that other bed and kale. 
And in addition, during the pandemic, um, we are partnering up with Brookhaven Campus uh, to help take care of their beautiful windmill garden of uh, Texas native plants that they have. And of course, this is a beautiful okra flower. Um, that was actually at the Mountain View campus. Okay, last but not least, adding value to the local institution. So we did all of this work. Is it paying off? How do we measure success? Well, good news is I think it did. <laughs> so in fall 2018, we had six students, very small class, but it was, it was good um, uh, to break everyone in. And uh, we were able to double that enrollment the next year. And by fall 2020, we had 93 <laughs> enrollments and 74 unique students. So it exploded um, as word got out. And we knew it was going to take some time for the word to get out. We knew the interest was there. Every time we talked with students, we knew there was an interest. But sometimes um, it just takes a while for the message to get out. So uh, this signaled <laughs> that there was some amount of success. We were the fastest growing discipline area in all of Dallas College last uh, semester. And uh, this is even with the pandemic hitting. So at the top, right, we have a graph of the total headcount, total enrollment of all of Dallas College. You can see between the red and the gold, there was a decrease about 10% because um, you know, students are picking up extra jobs wherever they can instead of focusing on school uh, just to make ends meet. So we think that might be why there was a drop in enrollment uh, because of the pandemic. But within agriculture, our enrollments still grew. So we outpaced the trend for the rest of the college. And uh, this is that same data in just a different form. And um, it is continuing to grow. So uh, case by case, so different form of data stories. So these uh, students are part of an honors uh, organization called PTK. Um, and they started a petition to add more urban gardens in uh, the southern area of Dallas. And uh, we partnered up with them to host a workshop to teach folks how to take care of uh, their own gardens at home and install them um, either in their community or uh, in their backyard. And of course, we partner up with our local food pantries on campus. Um, and we are very blessed to have the North Texas Food Bank as partners on campus. Uh, but of course, this is not just uh, charity. We're not just uh, growing food um, just for ourselves or to give away. We really are building up skills in students so that they'll be prepared for the workforce. Agriculture is one of the largest employers um, and uh, food systems. We've seen this time and time again in the last year. Uh, they are only increasing in importance, um, the resiliency of our food system during climate change as storms uh, become more severe and more frequent and as um, these new outbreaks occur. Okay, and we also try our best to partner with community leaders uh, so and highlight the work that they're doing. We do not want to take the place of community leaders. We want to uplift, amplify their message and highlight their awesome work in the community. Um, so Harvest Project is a great example of that. Danae Gutierrez is a saint. She's awesome. I don't know how she does all that she does. You know, God packed three people into that one person. <laughs> she is awesome. Um, and so Harvest Project is a great partner. They get, they rescue food. Um, on the right hand side, there's a picture of the work that the Harvest Project is doing. They rescue food uh, so that it can go instead of the, into the dumpster it goes out to the community completely free of charge, completely run by volunteers. And the Harvest Project actually supplies other local organizations in Dallas. So they are such a, a key organization in our backyard. And the Oak Cliff Veggie Project helps uh, disperse some of that rescued produce. 
from the Harvest Project. Um, we also try to convene different stakeholders from the community. Um, uh, so uh, just to get the conversation rolling and get some synergies uh, going. Uh, this is uh, Big Tech's Urban Farms. So we try to work with them um, and give uh, students opportunities there. And Farmers Assisting Returning Military, we've partnered with them in uh, trying to host some informational webinars. Mill City Urban Farm is a really great resource for the community. They work with kids uh, and teaching kids how to garden and grow their own food. And Darcia Houston is also a really key community leader who helps um, uh, focus on holistic health and well being and helps folks uh, take up a, a healthier lifestyle through work with the soil and work with plants. Um, we also uh, put together a little growing guide that's really easy to understand for containers because we felt there was kind of a, a lack of information about how to grow in containers in Dallas specifically. So um, again, my favorite plant to grow in a five gallon bucket is potatoes. They're the best. But also I think uh, uh, this uh, mustard is a lot of fun to grow too and very nutritious. Uh, and then of course we have a fall planting season that is often overlooked um, and underutilized. So we wanna highlight that too. Okay, so what's next? Um, the Agriculture Academy is what we are all gearing up for right now. Um, a press release is about to come out officially, uh, but we're working on the groundwork right now. So you all are <laughs> some of the first folks to know about this. Uh, there's a brand new partnership that we just signed with uh, Texas A&M Commerce so that we can offer more agricultural classes in Dallas. Um, it's more convenient for students and because they're taking their first two years of their bachelor's with us, it's a lot uh, uh, less tuition. So it's a lot less expensive for students to complete their bachelor's degree. And then once they complete courses with us and commerce in Dallas, uh, they just need to finish out their senior year, their last year of their bachelor's degree up in commerce. So for those students who are commuting or uh, local to Dallas, it's a great opportunity. So if you know anyone who's interested in um, agriculture and completing their degree, uh, please reach out. This is the information to contact us, agacademy at dccd.edu or bob.williams at tamuc.edu. He's our partner over there. Uh, and just wanted to highlight that this is a great opportunity uh, to take advantage of the brand new bachelor's program in sustainable agriculture and food systems. It's a brand new degree that just opened up uh, a couple semesters ago at Commerce. So um, I definitely encourage you guys to check that out. And I included a little information about food loss and food waste because of course our food system is not just uh, reliant on production. It's also reliant on uh, the efficient use of the resources that we've already invested into the food system. So we've already grown the food. <laughs> we need to be sure that it's going out to people who need it. Because um, if we were able to save even just one quarter of the food that is wasted, um, we'd be able to feed the hungry in our communities. So with that, uh, we're just continuing to build towards a more resilient uh, food system. Uh, this is an academic paper that I really appreciate. They outline four different ways to make uh, food systems more resilient and sustainable. Um, so I'll just, I'm looking at my time here and I don't want to hold us over. So I'm just going to toggle through those real quick. <laughs> um, and if if we want to talk more about it, that's great. But I just wanted to, before I leave, um, say a few shout outs to the awesome folks at Dallas College and at Commerce and Jeff Raska at AgriLife Extension. Um, of course, our partners at UNT Dallas, Jared Tynes and Mariah Brown, who keeps everything going <laughs> behind the scenes. So um, 
Thanks so much for having me. And I would love to answer any questions that you might have or talk about any random topic about the food system too. So just unmute yourself and chime in with a question if you have one for Dr. Casey. Hi, this is Brittany. Um, I had a question about growing vegetables in the five gallon bucket. So I actually have tried uh, growing potatoes in five gallon buckets. Um, and I was just wondering, is it more effective if you drill holes in the bottom of the buckets or can, does it really matter if there's holes or no? Oh yeah, it matters a lot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, and I have um, uh, this past growing season. So this was, so you can plant potatoes in the spring and in the fall. Uh, spring is right about now. You'd be planting around Valentine's Day. Um, fall would be August, early August that you'd wanna be planting. Our fall potatoes in buckets failed miserably because oh. we used the wrong type of soil. It was really disgusting and disheartening, yeah. <laughs> so if you can see, well, there's lots of perlite, the white balls mm. in the soil here. Uh, it's a heavy in peat moss, so it's very, no, it's not heavy, it's light, but there's just a lot of peat moss in it and it holds a lot of water, uh, which potatoes go through a fair amount of water. So um, it really depends on the type of soil um, that you use. And also potatoes are a little different in that you want to plant them about four inches deep. And then as the shoot grows up, um, you want to continuously cover it with soil. So I'm just toggling back to, okay. So oh. on the left-hand side, this is what you'll see at first. And then okay. as it continues to grow, well, you probably already know this because you <laughs> mentioned that you've, you've grown them before, but as they continue to grow, uh, you'll just continuously fill up that bucket until it gets to that third picture, which I don't fill it up the full way because it's really annoying when you water them and the water just spills off the top mm -hmm. until it leave that lip so that it can just um, funnel on down. Uh, but yeah, it, it depends on the type of soil you use. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't say that I, I grew them successfully. <laughs> I had them out on a balcony and uh, there was a kind of an intense rainstorm and they ended up drowning, I believe. And I also plant and tried to plant like 10 eyes in a single bucket, which was not, not hey, a good idea either. I, I am guilty of that too. Try to yeah. maximize uh, amount of plant per square foot, but <laughs> then they end up competing with each other and it's just, yeah. it doesn't work out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. That's great. And I'll show you too. Um, so uh, Mill City drilled holes in their buckets. And there we go. S see the bottom left mm. picture? That's mm -hmm. the size of holes that we aim for with five gallon buckets because oh. we really want to be sure there's airflow moving at the bottom of that bucket. Because if not, it can get really um, anaerobic very fast. So not oh, enough okay. air down towards the roots there. We have a okay, question. Is there something you recommend drilling that size of hole with? Yep. I don't have a picture of it here, but um, it's a hole saw. It's called a hole saw. It literally is like a circle. Um, mm -hmm. So, saw. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have a question that was posed by Jaya Shree via chat, and then we'll get to Mickey next. Jaya Shri asks, do you have resources or have small courses for those who have home gardens and house plants in general? Yes, absolutely. So um, we have free webinars and then our classes are full tuition rate um, because they are university transfer classes. I mean, that's what they were built to do. Um, if you are looking for just some tips and tricks on um, keeping your garden alive and more productive, I highly recommend the webinars. So you can learn about those on our, um, on our social media. And I think I just, um, so our social media handle there is at agriculture underscore DC for Dallas College. 
So if you follow us on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, uh, you'll see those events when they pop up. Thank you. Uh, I think Mickey's next. And uh, Simon, did you have a question that you wanted to ask too? Did you want to get in the question queue or? Uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll okay. Wait. But yes. Okay, and then there's a this, couple of this more. This may be, yeah, this may be a little random. Questions. But our environment cannot handle the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus we're putting into it. Uh, mm -hmm. Witness the Mississippi is dead for 5,000 kilometers around the mouth. And we have, uh, Kenya just issued a statement that 70% of their agricultural food supply is inedible because of excessive use of chemicals, both uh, pesticides and fertilizers. So I'm curious. One, can we feed the world without so much over chemicals? And two, are y'all looking at teaching people the proper use of chem chemicals and the moderate use of chemicals? Yes, very much so. So uh, there's so many different points to your question. Um, I'll just say uh, on the plant breeding end, they are looking at how to um, increase the beneficial relationship between nitrogen fixing bacteria, those um, rhizobia in the soil uh, and their associations with roots. That's why legumes like soybeans, um, uh, our beans are able to fix nitrogen because they're able to form those little nodules in their roots that house a special bacteria that is able to fix just free nitrogen gas in the air and uh, create nitrates that the plant is able to use. So uh, a lot of research is going into how do we make sure that we can, you know, um, uh, make use of that uh, technology uh, that's already alive in nature um, so that we don't have to add on exogenous uh, nitrogen that is going to leach out of that soil and down into the Mississippi and into the Gulf and uh, kill a lot of um, aquatic life and um, human health too. Um, and then uh, feeding the world. Yes, so uh, it's complicated. <laughs> we call food security a wicked problem. Um, it's an academic term to say that it's a problem that is constantly evolving. There's no one good solution, no matter how many times you try, there's no silver bullet. Um, and a lot of times those wicked problems are solved through, not even solved, but managed at the local level. So finding solutions that work in that context, it may not be a copy and paste, you know, what works in Dallas may not work in Fort Worth, may not work in Houston or Austin, but um, yeah, just acknowledging the importance of the context. Um, so soil is different, um, the different types of crops, the climates are different, um, the, yeah, all those things are different. Um, so, uh, I mean, there's a lot of hungry people in the world right now, you know, and our population is only growing. So it, I don't wanna uh, dismiss the problem. It is a real issue. Um, but I think one thing that is overlooked is the fact that we have so much food that really is going to waste um, and we can make better use of the food that we have and make sure that it's equitably distributed and accessible to folks. Um, Cause it may be on the shelf, but it's too expensive for them to afford. You know, how do we, and how do we mitigate those effects? Um, so it's a complicated issue. It is truly, I appreciate that question. Simon, there, would you is there like anything I didn't hit on that you want me to elaborate on more? Well, I think you I think you got the major points. I mean, the issue is that we have to learn how to feed our people. Um, I think I'll contact you separately and see if you want to have an extension farm in uh, Kenya. Oh, yeah. I, I'm one of my <laughs> roommates <laughs> in graduate school. Uh, she she was uh, she is Kenyan. I mean, she yeah. Um, and we talked a lot about that yeah, and the importance of smallholder farmers. So. I, I'd yep. love to connect with you about that. Maybe they know each other, you know, from a similar uh, area of Kenya. That'd be cool. Simon, why don't you go ahead with your question? Then there's three more on chat we'll get to briefly. 
Thank you, Dr. Casey. I appreciate you coming today. I had a question about your vermiculture composting. Mm -hmm. Is that an indoor or outdoor solution? <laughs> uh, great question. Um, so uh, I'm not Heather Rinaldi. Heather is the expert, um, local or national. Um, so she runs the Texas Worm Ranch and I highly recommend taking that course. It's only $50 and you walk out with a tub full of worms. So you're ready to go. <laughs> um, it's, it's a good use of money. Uh, she would say, um, outdoors. That's the, I mean, indoors, I apologize. Um, and that's the only way that I've found success, but I have talked to other folks who have insulated their worm bins, um, in such a way that they're able to survive outside. But I'm wondering if those worms are a different type of worm um, because from what I understand the red wigglers that are normally used in vermicompost cannot handle especially the temperatures that we experienced this last week um, but uh, earthworms that we find in the ground in our gardens naturally are very different from the red wigglers not very but they're different from the red wigglers that we have in vermicompost bins so um, I do recommend uh, keeping it inside if you can. And they don't escape. They actually don't like the light. So um, it, you you have holes. Just a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn my camera off so I can go get one. I'll be right back. No. So we have uh, this, you would ideally have a larger one than this, but we just drilled holes uh, for airflow in, in them. And then students are able to put their names on it with uh, masking tape. And you just take the lid right off and it's, it's ready to go. So um, they don't escape um, and they do just fine in this smaller bucket. Um, if you could get a larger one, that's even better uh, because you don't have to manage the moisture levels as much. They, they just are happier in a bigger bucket, but we can't fit that in our classrooms. So this is our compromise. <laughs> I, I am glad you, you mentioned that you said it was um, indoors. So that's kind of what I was going toward. Has there been any like motion toward with design or information making this something that's agreeable to people living in apartments? Like maybe like some some kind of actual shift where instead of we're throwing out a bunch of food waste, we're actually composting it and then donating it, community gardens, whatever. It, yes. So I live in an apartment um, uh, and we, yeah, I just have my own um, in our you know, office here, <laughs> hanging out. Um, but as far as it being a service, that's accessible. Um, I guess it would probably need to be part of like inside of an office for the apartment um, and then kind of serviced maybe by folks who sign up for that. That's a good question. I, I like your line of thinking there. That's nice. Yeah. I always thought it would be really cool if apartments took out part of their parking um, and put those grow boxes in or mm -hmm. some raised uh, beds on pallets uh, and make a community garden accessible to their residents in a parking lot, you know, <laughs> but parking is such a premium too. So I understand that, but um, yeah, uh, I like that thinking. Good idea. Okay, thank you. We've got lots, probably more questions than we have time for, but we'll, we'll try and get at least a couple more in. Uh, Jeff Liu has asked, I have a question on the food last slide, I think it is. Yeah, hey, uh, hey Cara, this is uh, Jeff. Um, just have a question on the food loss slide, um, part, in particular like about like the countries. Uh, I, I, I think like US ranked like number three and then was it Saudi ranked right. number one? Yeah. Yeah, so just, just wondering, like, do you have, like, other, like, yeah, like, do, do we have some, like, details or, you know, like, do, do anyone, like, do we have some, like, analysis on, like, why, you know, what, what, what are, like, the costs is? Is it, like, more, like, cultural or is it more, like, you know, um, geographical? 
Um, <clears throat> that's a great question. I'm not sure. Um, uh, I will say that I thought about putting the link in for the website that I got this off of, but um, it was hard to copy and paste on here. I figured we could just use this as a source. So um, it's by the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition. So um, yeah, I this whole two slides is just a graphic that I cut in half because um, it wouldn't fit on one slide. <laughs> but uh, I think within that article uh, that went with this infographic, they have more information on that. So I'm sorry that I just- uh, Can I, I jump in here? Yeah, go for it. Um, so I have lived in the Middle East for some time and uh, to uh, refer to Jeff's question, I used to be scandalized at the amount of food that was thrown away at every gathering that we went to. Mm -hmm. And it's cultural thing. Mm -hmm. So everyone would just pile up their plates with so much food that we know a person cannot eat. And it is like, I'm well off person, so I can throw away so much food. That's the thing I noticed for the two years that I was there. It is horrible to see the ways uh, that the like processed food is done. That's the way it is treated. If they need six eggs for something, they will buy almost two, three dozen and mm -hmm. just throw away in the dumpster. So it was more as a, like, you know, I'm well off, I can afford it. I thought, I don't know, I didn't read any uh, detail information about it, but that's what I notice. Almost like a status, like I can afford it. So why not? Uh, yeah. Got it. Thank, thanks for sharing, Joshi. And uh, thank, thank you, Kara. I'll, I'll look it up, the article. Thank you. Thank you. There's a couple of questions on the chat that are, uh, I think, pretty short. We can take them. We need to start thinking about wrapping up. Um, Melinda, can we find the guide to planting times for containers online? Um, <clears throat> it might be complicated. What I'm going to do is, I'm not sure if you're able to screenshot it. I'm going to pull it up real fast for you. That way you can just, okay, so that is fall. If you want to take a screenshot and then this is spring. So. Uh, we might be able to post your slides if you're willing as well. Yeah, absolutely, this... absolutely. And I, yeah, yeah. yeah and I do some, have a PDF some, copy. Somebody has asked if, if we have in the slides your contact information, if you're willing to share that. Yes, it is on the first slide, yes. Okay, and the last question, maybe the last, um, can you post a pic of the slide that show, oh, Oh, I think it's the same question about the, the, the when to plant. So those, those two slides you just showed. So that our final question will be by our chair. Um, there are some, uh, some folks have posted some things in chat, so you might wanna look at those people attending. But Roger, I think you had a short question to pose. Oh, I don't know if it's if it's short. You know me, Richard. I, I always talk uh, long-windedly. Uh, Dr. Casey, fantastic presentation. Obviously, generating a lot of interest in the chapter, and uh, and so appreciative of you doing this. Um, I want to ask you a, a non-sciencey question. It's it's related to uh, Mickey Lynn's question earlier. We've got a new administration in Washington. And during the, the Democratic primaries, there was a great deal of talk by a number of the, of the candidates about regenerative agriculture and federal policy in support of that. As, as you think of, if you take off your scientist hat for a second, uh, but informed by all of that and think about what priorities you would, you would be setting uh, for the federal government. What, what are the most important things that you would like to see done legislatively to promote regenerative agriculture here in the US? Uh, two immediate things come to mind is um, the stark inequality in subsidies that are available for grain crop farmers versus vegetable farmers. So um, 
farming is a risky business, no matter what crop you're growing. And if you're growing a crop that's going out straight to consumer, um, I think you're, you have a lot more risk too. <laughs> so I think um, that's one thing is making sure that those farmers that are growing fruits and vegetables uh, have access to the same amount of subsidies and support, maybe more so, uh, maybe even more than traditional conventional farmers. Um, there's a lot of reason why that inequality exists that I think can read between the lines. <laughs> um, number two uh, is SNAP benefits. So I'm a big fan of expansion of SNAP because I think, um, uh, yeah, uh, people need access to food and it's helpful for farmers too if people have that funds to spend, you know, even if it's government money that they're spending on vegetables, um, uh, that goes into the pocket of a local farmer. So, um, but uh, local produce can be more expensive because um, for various reasons. So another program that's really helpful that should get more support is um, the Double Up Bucks program where uh, people uh, using EBT, using SNAP, um, are able to get twice the amount of produce for the same amount of money. Um, and that's subsidized by SNAP too. So good questions. Those are the two things that come to mind. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm sure I, I more know, will come up later. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I love the first answer. I, I read a piece by Mark Bittman. You know, everybody has his cookbook, but he was, he was talking about corn in Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, how many how many tens of millions of acres of corn were being grown, but less than one percent of that was sweet corn for human consumption. Yeah. It was all being raised as animal feed, and mm -hmm. heavily subsidized by by the industries that want to promote uh, animal uh, mm -hmm. growing and use for meat. So it, it gets right to your first point. We've got to we've got to shift that subsidy market around. Thanks again. This was terrific. Thank just, you for having me. I really appreciate it. Wonderful presentation, Dr. Casey. Thank you so much. I think uh, we all enjoyed it. Big round of applause. You're certainly welcome to stay on. We just have a few other things to cover. We'll be done by 2.30. Uh, thank you so much again for the presentation and we'll be communicating about maybe getting your slides uh, on our website. Thank you. So, um, Next item on our agenda, I know we have Paula Day and Kelly Longfellow from the Faith-Based Working Group who are gonna talk about their working group for uh, just a few minutes. Great, Kelly, are you on? I think you're gonna start. Yes, am I? I don't see myself. Anyway. I can I see I you. Oh, my glasses are dark. <laughs> Um, good afternoon. Yes, um, Paula and I are the co-leads um, for the faith group, and we have decided to um, do a joint event with um, um, Green Faith. And as we call is Green Faith, because I'm also with that organization as well. So this event, uh, this international event, but we're going to hold a local uh, group event here in the Dallas area, is called, is on actually March 11th at 7 p.m. And it's nationwide, I'm sorry, worldwide on that day. The reason why it's March 11th is actually is between many uh, faith um, celebrations. Um, it's so in, it's also in between other um, nationalities or national um, elections. So it's actually in the middle of everything to kick this off. And it's actually called Sacred Earth, Sacred People. And there are 10 um, items that this event is highlighting. It's kind of like the 10 um, earthly demands that all of us sacred persons on the sacred earth wants to highlight for a, you know, for a healthy future for all earthlings and all, uh, all people. So that event is going to be on the 11th. And so with that, there will be a, um, an agenda and a format for us to follow with discussion. Um, we will need to probably get a Zoom as well for that so I can advertise it as well for it to be a public event for all persons of faith to attend. 
And then Paula has an event for us to talk about as well. So any questions about that? So I was just trying to find the uh, website to put in the chat, which I'll do after we finish up. So you can see the 10 areas that they cover because they really align um, very well with um, climate reality interests. So I'll, I'll get that in the chat. Um, but uh, so uh, as Kelly mentioned, you know, we've been trying to get this off the ground. Um, but I think one thing that was really encouraging to me as I was reading, um, we, we have a couple of groups that we're trying to connect with at a larger level. Um, and one of them is called um, Faiths for Future. And um, this is actually led by a, a, a trained climate reality leader. And she's um, you know, put a, a coalition of people together. And in her recent communication to those of us on her list, she mentioned that the, at the upcoming virtual training, the, um, the weekday session, because you know, if you've investigated, there's two sessions, you can either do the weekend or the weekday. At the weekend, they're actually putting together a cohort for uh, people interested in um, you know, approaching this from the, the faith base. So she went in and, and mentioned you know, how you could um, say that you wanted to be part of that. So I think what this will do is give um, those of us in chapters who want to have a working group, you know, kind of a, a larger um, connection point to the national chapter. So I think that's encouraging. Um, and then I'm just trying to find the name of, um, so we have a couple of other groups that we've been trying to connect with because what we really don't want to do is reinvent the wheel. We're just trying to find other groups that are already collecting resources and, um, you know, having, uh, you know, greater, you know, broader discussions. And that's, you know, what we're trying to connect our working group to. So in addition to Face for Future, um, Kelly and I talked with um, a group uh, called Texas Impact, which is a faith-based lobbying and you know, uh, legislative action group, but they look at more than just climate justice, but that's one of their priority areas. So we're trying to get uh, further connected with them. And of course, then as Kelly mentioned, Green Faith. Um, so we just wanna let you know, that's what we're up to. We are going to you know, organize for this March 11th event. And then we're hoping that we can connect with uh, some of you who are interested in, in going, you know, further with us on, um, you know, looking, at, you know, again, very simple source of, um, you know, great source of uh, presentations, you know, to go out to people's faith-based communities. And then also to help, you know, if you're connected to uh, any kind of uh, faith-based organization to help them think about um, how they use their resources, audits and, and those kinds of things. So I think that's it. Yes, Melinda, thank you so much for recognizing you sure you're doing sanctuary task. Yes, at the UU, which is fantastic. And so we would love for you to join our group because once again, you know, how it's kind of the fork in our what do we really want to do with this, you know, group faith? Um, you, do you, we, how do you just give, give presentations or how do you help them um, be sustainable? You know, help them with their energy usage their green purchasing and cleaning products. You know, or, or, um, and their air quality is a big thing now right now with COVID-19. So what are the healthier choices to, to use in a church and for their purchasing? And of course, like an operation plan that's more sustainable and more um, uh, eco-friendly. So we have a lot to offer with this discussion in groups. You know, how do you reach out you know, to the faith organization and how, how do you get the door in? Or how do you open the door? So yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Paula and Kelly. Uh, next up, we have uh, the Legislative Action Working Group. We'd like to say a few words, and we have Roger and Alan uh, who can uh, who can share that with us. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, I, I first want to say I'm just I'm I'm really pleased and delighted that so many people signed on today, given the ordeal that everybody's been through. I, I really appreciate your presence. Um, and, and I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, about what's coming up with the faith-based group. There are lots of things going on in the various working groups. If you're not signing on uh, to, the, to the website yet and looking at what's posted on the pages for the different working groups, please start doing that. Um, groups are taking all kinds of interesting action that you need to know about. But I want to say a few words specifically about the new legislative working group that Alan Kasdoy is heading up. If you're paying attention to climate reality at the national level at all, you know that this is designated as a year for legislative action. We just had two uh, very detailed workshops on how to lobby. Those toolkits are now available. We have them. 
we have tremendous opportunities for action this year at all three levels of government. First of all, the city of Dallas has elections coming up in April and, and then May um, for city council. City council has control over CCAP. We, we put a lot of time and effort into getting a good climate action plan written for, for Dallas. Now it needs to be implemented. That will be up to city council. So Simon Rook is um, heading up our, our effort. We need to be reaching out to city council candidates. We need to continue to make relationships with the people who get elected so that we can make sure CCAP gets implemented as quickly as possible. Simon is also a master map maker. He knows where you live. He knows who, if you're in Dallas, we already know who your candidates in your district are. We're gonna be organizing around that. One quarter of the members of this chapter, more than 55 people live in Dallas and ought to be getting involved at the local level. This is, this is grassroots stuff, folks. If you are interested in solving the climate crisis, cities have a major, major role to play. At the federal level, climate reality has in their workshops have just laid out a number of priorities. They're gonna be promoting certain uh, legislative uh, agendas on the Hill. The main one is that they're wanting us all to get behind the coming infrastructure bill from the Biden administration, $2 trillion for infrastructure. Much of that is devoted to, to infrastructure that is directly relevant to solving the climate crisis. Climate reality is calling for 100 meetings in-person meetings with representatives in Congress. We know who your congressman is now or woman. We know which districts you're in. Alan is gonna be heading up our efforts at the federal level. But in between, there is the state legislature of Texas. I put out a call on Discord, I haven't had an answer. I know lots of you on this call today are already very engaged but we need someone who can organize at the state level. And after the week we've been through, do I have to tell you how important state law is? Why do you think we have the energy system we have? I was on a call for an hour and a half this morning with a number of state senators and representatives talking about new bills that are being filed, specifically related to how ERCOT functions and how, how it's gonna function going forward. If you don't know who your state representative is, who your state senator is, we do. We've got those districts mapped too. But I need somebody in the chapter who's willing to help organize all of this so that for particular districts, we can get the message out to the right people. It won't take an enormous amount of organizing time. I'm not asking you to do all the lobbying, just help get the information sent out to members in the chapter so you can contact your state representative and your state senator. We're also partnering with all the other chapters in Texas uh, around identifying specific bills that we wanna promote or oppose. We're working with Rita Beving very closely at Public Citizen. She's been a professional lobbyist for 10 years. She knows how to work with the Texas Ledge. So there are tremendous opportunities for everybody to get involved but we need help to get this done at the state level. So Simon at the city level, Alan at the federal level, somebody please help us out in, in terms of the state of Texas. Um, the, need, the need there is great. Um, I'm gonna drop my email address in the chat one more time in case anybody doesn't know how to get in touch with me and wants to step up, put in an hour, more if you've got it, but an hour a week would already be a tremendous step forward. We're gathering all the information. We just need to make sure everybody gets it. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll leave it there, uh, unless, Alan, unless there's something else you wanna add, but I think that's, that was the territory we were gonna cover. Uh, no, but thanks for mentioning all of that. And uh, yeah, we had a very uh, productive conversation with Rita uh, about the state legislation and the priorities there. So yeah, there's a whole lot uh, going on here with the city council elections and uh, 
and of course the federal uh, stuff. So yeah, so we want everybody to get involved. So uh, uh, if we have the uh, uh, our information on the, the Discord uh, site there for uh, for a working group, yeah, we want everybody to get involved and uh, so they can be ready to contact their uh, council people, candidates, and reps and senators. Thank you, Roger and Alan. Uh, yeah, well, I just, yeah, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, while I'm a little bit behind the, a few days, I was a uh, climate the refugee for two days. Uh, uh, we had to stay at, uh, <laughs> we had to stay at uh, uh, neighbors uh, when we were frozen out of our house, but I'm not complaining. I just hope everyone here didn't uh, experience terrible consequences that we've heard about and all of your loved ones are, are safe and warm. Uh, I did lose my job as Ted Cruz's uh, travel agent, but other than that, uh, uh, I think everything is, uh, is going to be okay. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Uh, Maria Salman uh, is going to talk to us for a few minutes about self-care for activists, which is as important now as it has ever been. We need to be well ourselves to help others. So. Maria, I'll, if you'll unmute yourself, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Hi. Um, so we have formed a self-care group, um, and hopefully you'll, you'll be seeing more from us as, as time goes on. Um, actually, for today, I won't be... I'll be talking, but it's we're going to actually ease into a little um, visualization. So um, we've been in a meeting for some time and talking and looking at our screen. So maybe we'll just tune in to ourselves. Um, so I'm gonna invite you to, to either lay down if you have a carpet nearby that you feel comfortable to lay down on, on your back. Um, you could also just choose to, to continue sitting. Um, just try to find a straight spine if possible and just a comfortable um, position. So so I invite you to close your eyes and just settle in your body. Um, we've been in social outward mode and just tune in to yourself. If you can relax your face and see how far you can go with that. Maybe letting go of your jaw letting it drop, your eyes. And whatever part of your body is touching the floor, just really meet, let your weight sit there. And I'd like you to imagine for a second that you are walking into a forest. Maybe just like me, you're hearing people around you. Or maybe you're alone. And paint a picture for yourself, the kind of forest you love, whether that's big, old trees, long, thin trees. Find the color that you love. Is it bright? Is it springtime? Is it winter time? Begin to paint a picture of you walking in a forest. What time of day is it?
What's your pace? And you begin to become enamored with this forest that you fell upon. You hear the birds, some close to you, some far. You feel the wind on your skin. And you're alone, but you feel connected to this forest. You can hear the ecosystem. Perhaps you even feel part of it. And as you walk deeper into this forest, you find that there's an open field. Almost like a circle. Maybe it's sand, dry mud, or grass. Imagine something that feels comfortable enough that invites you in to go into this open field in the middle of the forest and lay in the center. Whatever worries you've been holding on to until now, they just dissipate. You are being held by the earth, literally. And you fall into a deep sleep. Your toes begin to tingle. Your hands begin to tingle. You are woken up by the forest once again. Maybe it's a bird. Maybe it was the wind, the dead leaves making sounds. You wake up. You look around you. You use your arms and your elbows to help you slowly stand back up. And you're in awe of where you find yourself. You begin to take your steps from the center of the circle back into the edges back towards the woods. And you take slow steps. You feel rejuvenated, like you just hibernated a long, rejuvenating sleep. And your slow steps turn into quicker steps. And you're excited. You have all this newfound energy, a sense of healing from the sleep you had. And you begin to walk faster, leaving the forest, you begin to leap and your leap, they turn into strides and soon you find yourself running running and inside you, your wild side just comes through and you are part of the forest running outside, ready to share all this energy you regained to the outside world. And slowly you see that you're reaching the end of the forest. And you see the city, the people, the cars, the streets, all of it, the same way when you left, all of it's still there. But here you are holding that sacred experience close to you. And you wanna come back 
and share your energy and nourish everyone with it. And you know that you can come back to that forest anytime you'd like. And so you tune into the tempo of what's around you once again. And you begin to walk within the city. Now, just slowly tune into your body and listen to your breath. Don't try to change it, just be aware of it. Reconnect to your body where it is right now, right here. Letting go of the little journey you went on. Maybe if you feel ready, you can actually cross your arms over your chest and hug yourself. Weaving a little goodbye to the little sanctuary you might have created. And when you feel ready, whether you're laying down or sitting, Begin to wiggle your hands, your toes, coming back into your body and open your eyes when you feel ready. Thank you for letting me guide you on hopefully what was a nice little escapade. Um, I'd just like to share that our imagination um, we are here today because we're fighting for climate change and to battle it, sorry, but we have to imagine a healthier and better future. That's where the power is and to take care of ourselves, we can also imagine these little escapades that rejuvenate us. Because after all, our connection to nature is, well, it's what we need most, right? So um, hopefully you'll be hearing more from our group and we welcome um, all to join. Um, Self-care is a very, very big topic and, and we want to make sure that we're all doing that. So thank you. Thank you, Maria. That was, that was really very, very relaxing and helpful for these times. So we will end our meeting. Uh, hopefully those of you with infrastructure, house, power, internet water problems, get those resolved. And uh, please stay safe with uh, the pandemic is still going strongly, stay safe and uh, take a look at our website for what's next. And you all have a great rest of the weekend. We'll, we'll stay on for a few minutes, but we are officially adjourned. Thank you all. Um, hey, Richard, uh, can I share something? Sure. Uh, so this is, I am proud to or happy to share with you all that uh, seeing that we do not have much out there in the print media, I had applied to Dallas Voices, Public Voices uh, Fellowship, and I was selected. Yesterday, I got the phone call, and I'm so happy uh, I will post more information and share with you all, but that trains you to publish your point of view or whatever you want to say in uh, national print media. And if possible, if you are able to succeed into international print media also. So I wanted to share with this happy news because I do want to write about our climate 
uh, change and climate crisis and have a voice out there in the print media locally in the state and in the national joining those who are already doing it. So wish me luck everyone. And I hope I can do a good job. Congratulations and, and thank you for sharing that. Thank you. There's lots of resources in chat if, if anybody's interested. Uh, other than, and of course, Dr. Casey, if you have students that are interested in the climate change issue, we're, we're happy to uh, have them as members. Hi, everyone. Peace. Be well. Take care, Michael. Yeah, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Jeff and Leah. Thanks for hosting, uh, Richard. Sure. What, what happened to Dan, by the way? Did we lose him at some point? He was in for a while. Oh, okay. He was in for a while. All right. Bye, all. Bye, all right, Ryan. See you, Ryan. All right. See you, Richard. Have a okay, good one. Jeff, enjoy unpacking those boxes. Will we'll do. <laughs> Thank you. You got plenty of time. You don't have to finish it today, just by Monday. That, that's what Maria tells me all the time. I'm, I'm a little bit too rush. I'm doing things, but yeah, I'll try to take my time. <laughs> <laughs> take care. See you, Richard. Bye bye. bye. Okay, I will end the meeting. Stop the recording.